28 of the Croydon Constitutionalist podcast, bringing classical liberalism to South London and beyond via YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. My name is Dan Heaton and my partner in podcasting today is Mike Swaddling, the co-founder of the Croydon Constitutionalist. Mike, how are things with you? Yeah, good, thank you. Uh, weather's improving again and uh, and it's good that we're slowly getting back to some normality. Let's hope so. So, Mike, uh, what have we got to discuss on the podcast today? So uh, the ongoing discussion on COVID and, and some of the details around that that have come out this week. Um, Khan, our, our illustrious mayor for Lon- of London. Um, the Brexit trade talks. Uh, we've got a fantastic interview with Jeet Baines, the Conservative councillor for Addiscombe East, and what to do to stay busy. So COVID, the, uh, the story continues. Um, as anticipated, there has been some easing of the restrictions. Um, we can now go out and, uh, well, in England at least, you can uh, certainly go out and exercise more than once a day. And there have been some more shops that have uh, opened. I, uh, I noticed earlier that Marks and Spencers seems to be uh, seems to be open in uh, in Croydon. Uh, however, uh, we're still being told that we should uh, we should work from home if we can, um, and we should go to work subjects to. Uh, certain precautions being in place and we should avoid public transport if at all possible. Um, However, this this change of message from stay home to stay alert does seem to have been confusing for some and such illustrious characters as the First Minister of Scotland, uh, Nicola Sturgeon, who seemingly thinks that you you should not be allowed to to go to work. You must definitely stay home. Any change that message is confusing for Scottish people, apparently. Um, but Scottish people will now be allowed to uh, exercise more than once a day. Uh, Mike, how many Scottish people do you know that exercise more than once a day? As someone that's worked uh, quite a lot in Edinburgh, I can confirm all the stereotypes are unfortunately true. Um, yes, there's, uh, you know, Nicola Sturgeon clearly works. She clearly gets paid. Uh, she has a problem with the idea that her uh citizens in scotland should have the same opportunity as her that's that's a real shame that somebody in a public position takes that view uh wales as well stamping their feet essentially saying that wales is closed to business um but it's not just the uh the the national leaders who have been uh confused by this uh this this messaging from the from the prime minister we also have the the mayor of greater manchester andy burnham who decided to say the following he felt that the that the change of message was wrong and that he would feel disrespected um if he was someone in a care home because the, the because apparently there's a, there's a, a lot of people that are um, dying in care homes so if, if he was in a care home he would feel disrespected by the change of message so does andy burnham the mayor of greater manchester believe that people who are in care homes would be confused by whether or not they were supposed to go to work or not. I mean, is that what we've come to, where he couldn't find anything actually wrong with with the change of stance? He just had to criticise the messaging for for, politi- for politics' sake. I mean, it's just incredible. Um, it also strikes me that they think very little of people's common sense. Um, yes, there's a slogan there, but I think we're now moving into the stage where it's people should be using their common sense rather than than anything else. And hopefully in a couple of weeks, that will that will really be the case. And Mike, what do you think to this posturing by the politicians? Uh, There's the danger of politicians having this level of power and control of our lives is is all too obvious where you see this week that uh, the Minister for Health and Social Services in Wales, uh, Mr. Gethering, um, was caught breaking the rules outside having chips with his family now he said our five-year-old was hungry so we brought and we brought some chips all within the rules now 
that's perfectly reasonable. You, you're out with your, your young child. They're hungry. You buy some food. You sit on a park bench well away from others. What possible risk is there? What possible business is of the, of the government? Except he was wrong in saying it was within the rules. He was breaking his own sodding rules. How dare these people take that level of control? How dare a, a local mayor like Andy Burnham say the people in his town shouldn't be allowed to work? Who Who's, you know, so an error in our government to give themselves this power that they they think they they can tell us what to do in that way there is a, there is a, a reasonable idea in that that you know i'm a fan of localism giving giving regional authority and maybe their circumstances in manchester are different scotland are different from london or from from cornwall or whatever else it may be but if they're given that authority they've got to pick up the price and it you know if, if Scotland stays locked down, that's going to cost more money. Why should the English pay for that? Why should the English take their risk and pay for it? And, and sorry, just the last thing you're saying about the nursing homes there. Um, Dan, can you explain to me how me going to work in an office in Croydon affects the care home um, two miles away from there? Any, I, I'm, I'm struggling with the science on that one. Indeed. Indeed. I mean... Unless what you 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 got public transport and there was somebody who works at the care home that you know but it, 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 it but certainly you, the message on you being able to go into an office has got nothing to do with anybody who lives in a care home. It's, yeah. it's just it's just it's just it's just nonsense, really is. But um, but but hey, you know, we're looking to to get people back to work, whether that's working from home or or working in an office. Um, there were some rumours that uh, there'd be a bit of a, a nudge factor on this with the uh, the furlough scheme, uh, which for the most part is currently paying it um, 80 percent of um, of pre-COVID salaries. Um, and there was a suggestion that this might be reduced to 60 percent um, in the next few weeks in order to push people, encourage people uh, to go back to work. Uh, but once this was raised in the press, uh, the the chancellor of the Exchequer uh, said not only is he not going to be reducing the the furlough uh, figures, but that he's prepared to extend it until October. Um, sounds like a nice summer off for some people, Mike. It does, and and let's be fair, most of the people furloughed probably um, aren't necessarily having a great time. Uh, they are bored. They are worried about their jobs. Um, if you're on under two and a half thousand pounds a month there's a good chance 80% of your salary is actually a struggle, um, although you will have some cost savings. 60% of your salary would have been an absolute massive struggle. And, and maybe I've got a London-centric view of that, and perhaps, perhaps I have. Um, you know, two and a half grand wouldn't wouldn't necessarily cover it. And I'm, I'm really conscious of younger people. I, I know right up until sort of my mid to late 30s, um, probably a third of my income was on-call overtime bonuses, um uh extra extra responsibilities it wasn't my basic salary um so that 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 two and a half thousand is of your base salary not all the extras so you're an 80 percent of what's already actually only 70 percent or so of what you were really earning before um you know so so i'm not sure how nice it will be for everyone clearly it will be for some um it's a long time i, I read some statistics today that say there's 7.5 million jobs furloughed uh, 935,000 employers are furloughing people. The total amount claimed is already £10.1 billion. Pounds. Um, this is going to go on for a lot longer. It's going to get a lot higher than that. I don't know I don't know where we think this money is going to come from. And to anyone that is enjoying it, all you're doing is indebting yourself in the future. So any of us could choose every summer, for instance, to take three months off, um, you know, go down the park each day, spend some time by the coast or the river or whatever it may be and then and then pay it off over the winter months and you know have a fairly miserable time paying back the debt that's all we're doing and um, we wouldn't normally do that i don't know why it's a good idea now no it, it it's not and we just need to get back to work and um, back to something akin to normality as, as best we can as quickly as we can and that might mean that restrictions are removed slowly rather than all in one go 
But I think extending the furlough scheme to October is, is potentially just keeping people in jobs that, that no longer exist, unfortunately. Um, people who you might have businesses that would lay people off, um, but people are just being as it's paid to, to, to sit around. Um, obviously, for a lot of people, that's not great financially, let alone um, for the, the physical and mental well-being. Um, but I do think we, we need to move f- forward a lot quicker than October. So I don't know whether that was a, a you know, sort of gut reaction to the the suggestions in the press that we were we going to pull the pull the plug on the furlough scheme. But um, it does seem a, a long way off October. So um, hopefully we're in a better position way before then. Uh, hopefully in a, in a few weeks time. Just very worried that there will be a next winter peak yeah. and a lockdown of some sort. Um, which, you know, maybe not. Uh, I, I'm not convinced the lockdown's making a, a huge difference, and we're seeing that more and more from Sweden. But, but there just might be something that means things have to go back to some extent. Um, that's another load of money that seems to have to come out of somewhere. Uh, we we really need to be fighting fit before then economically, um, even if we're not, uh, uh, you know, in every other way at that stage. Yeah, totally agreed. Well, the Croydon Constitutionalists have been doing our bit during the lockdown, and we uh, recently hosted a uh, London Libertarian online meetup. Um, Mike it was good to uh, good to speak with some of the uh, the, the Libertarian Party people from uh, around the country, um, including the leader who uh, who kindly turned up for a little while. Uh, how, how did you find it? Yeah, good. Good to speak to um, some people from that party. Uh, they have a, a regular meet up in London every month normally uh, and go from time to time um, and they haven't been able to have one during lockdown and we thought well we'd give them the chance to host something and um, yeah yeah good to speak to them uh, uh, Libertarian Party covers a lot of views uh, and and they are very libertarian perhaps more so than than I am myself um, uh, but that's you know uh, that's that's this there's no bad thing being too f- in favour of freedom, um, we're particularly at a time where we see a, a country that's frankly too in favour of uh, uh, removing our freedom. So, yeah, good, great to catch up. Uh, I, I do wonder when things do get back to normal, whether the odd um, Zoom type uh, uh, meetups will become more of a thing, because it does give you a chance to meet people who, who aren't in your locality you wouldn't normally talk to. No, oh, definitely, definitely. It's the uh, the technology that you know we've utilised there. It is it has been priceless, I think, during the uh, the lockdown, both from a, a business perspective and a a sort of family perspective, uh, with people you know, people spread out across the country and indeed indeed the world these days. Uh, but when you you can't even go to see your friends or relatives who live you know just a a few, a few hundred yards away uh, potentially it's it's certainly coming to its own so um yeah i think we're going to see we're going to see more of that from uh, both a social and a business perspective uh, yeah. in the future so we mentioned that the, the furlough scheme there well our good friend the uh, the mayor of london sadiq khan i do think it may be time to furlough him um because We've discussed previously what his what his job really is, which is essentially to run TfL and the Metropolitan Police. Um, well, half of his job, that of running TfL, looks like it's going to be taken out of his hand somewhat uh, because TfL is getting a bailout. Um, despite its £9.7 billion annual budget, it's now going to get a £1.6 billion bailout. Yes, the man who said, oh, yeah, keep using the tube because you cannot catch COVID from the tube. The uh, I forgot, of course, it says Dr. Sadiq Khan, obviously, uh, epidemiologist that he is, um, uh, is now having to get a bailout from the from the government. Um, at the same time that we are saying don't use public transport, uh, don't worry, because TfL are bringing back the congestion charge and it's going to rise from £11.50 a day to £15 a day. Um, this is just balmy behaviour from, from from TfL and from the Mayor of London. Uh, Mike, what do you think about the latest developments? He, he's postured his way to the 
to the job. He's he's a good campaigner. Uh, he's popular in London. Um, uh, you know, the opinion polls sort of show you that. But he's not doing the day job. Now, you know, you think back our other mayors, uh, Ken Livingstone, who I, I probably agree with on nothing, um, did posture quite a bit, but but actually done a job. Um, lots of people tell you Boris didn't do a job. Um, uh, that's the the narrative. I'm, I'm never sure how, sure how true that is. But but even if it is entirely true, and all he done was appoint deputies that done the work for him, well, you know, good for him. Um, the job got done. What does Khan do? Crime's been a disaster in his time, um, and and now transport's a disaster. Uh, there was something reading on some of the stats on this that that. Um, they were asked to become self-sufficient TFLs back in 2014, um, but they Boris had identified 12 billion of savings. Um, Khan didn't find any and instead borrowed more. The the debt is now uh, they'd spent three he'd spent 300 million of cash reserves. Um, there's 400 million in interest being paid on the debt that Khan had before this happened, um, uh, and that it was a maximum ceiling of debt. Uh, that he'd already met. And this is before the COVID-19 crisis, uh, or he was always almost at it before the, 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 the crisis. You know, he just hasn't managed the system well at all. Um, and, and now, at a time we're being told to avoid public transport and to try and drive more and, and walk and cycle and everything else, he's banned cars from the centre of London or, or made them prohibitively expensive for, for those that can get in. This isn't joined up thinking unless unless the join up is you really don't like the people you're meant to represent. He, he, he I don't think he likes this country is, is to be honest with you. Um, his, his virtue signaling during his time in office, in particular in respect to, to President Trump and the uh, his demand for a people's vote has just been outrageous. But talking there about self-sufficiency for, for TFL, etc., uh, the Taxpayers Alliance reports that there are 30 TFL staff members, all of whom are earning over £50,000 a year, which who have the, t- the word diversity in their job title. That's where the mo- this is where the money is going. He's, vir- he's taking his virtue signalling to, to extremes because he refuses to actually do the day job properly. We've got, we've, well, perhaps I don't know, we'll, we'll see the figures during the uh, during the lockdown, but... We've had absolute knife crime, the, the knife crime pandemic that when we used to word, use the word pandemic for something else, we had a knife crime pandemic in certain parts of London. In particular, uh, Croydon's been been pretty bad uh, because he refuses to use stop and search because he worries what people think rather than the actual the actual practice, which undoubtedly uh, reduces the carrying of, of knives from uh, from young people. Um, and now TfL is effectively bankrupt. Uh, but with all this, I mean, the, the question is really when we get to, to May next year and we, we get to the now postponed mayoral election, will there be a candidate that's actually going to stand up to him and, and give him a, uh, a proper race for the uh, for the mayoral team? I, I sadly can't see that being the case. Um, Sean Bailey, uh, uh, and I, I was quoting from some of his stuff there earlier, um, he, he, he seems very sensible. Um, but just he, he hasn't caught fire. He hasn't he hasn't uh, ignited uh, anything in the people of London in the way that that um, even the chap who lost last time at Khan, whose name escapes me, uh, did. Um, Go so me. thank you. Um, you know, yeah, Goldsmith for all his. You know, he lost quite badly, but at least he, he seemed to have a bit more oomph about him. Obviously, we've we've spoken to uh, David Curtin, who's running as an independent. I think it's it's reasonable to say that his chances of wearing, winning the morality, morality is are pretty slim. But at least he's making arguments. At least he's 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 saying things that that need to be said um, that that challenge the mayor. I don't see that from the Conservatives at the moment, um, and and. You know, Khan, his posturing, unfortunately, is very popular in certain circles. Indeed. Well, moving on now from uh, from, from our mayor, 
uh, let's uh, go a little bit further afield and uh, some developments in the in the Brexit trade talks are well some some developments and some non-developments really uh, the EU uh, in the trade talks with the EU they seem to be coming to a, a blockage because the EU is insisting on uh, on access to our fishing waters and setting all kinds of standards in this country uh, which is of course way beyond what you would expect in any in any trade deal such as the the Canada trade deal that's been uh, much talked about um, meanwhile trade talks have begun with with Japan uh, which is uh, which is looking promising and obviously the the US trade talks are continuing um, however uh, our, our esteemed virtual now parliament uh, was voting this week on some on the on the agriculture bill and the agriculture bill is going to be crucial as we move away from the common agricultural policy and, and therefore we need this this new bill and a certain amendments were were tried to be put into the bill uh, effectively to to scupper our trade talks with the uh, with the US um, quite humorously the uh, the uh, the chancellor the uh, the aforementioned uh, Rishi Sunak actually got confused apparently by the uh, the voting mechanism and voted uh, for the amendments and therefore uh, against the government however because of the government's majority the uh, the amendments were defeated um mike what do you think about the uh, latest developments with the uh, the eu's position and uh, our our glorious parliament trying to uh, trying to scupper us once again I'm watching, um, and I think it's The Last Kingdom, it's called, it's, it's a series on Netflix uh, where the Danes are invading the north of England and Wessex and Mercia as the Saxons are trying to fight them off. And the Britons from uh, Wales are, are their own kingdom and occasionally get involved. And, and I'm reminded of that when you deal with the EU. Uh, Mercia felt itself proudly independent. Wessex felt it was a satellite state. There was a degree of tribute paid between them. Um, the Danes felt they could come in and take what they wanted because that's just how they done things. Uh, it, uh, Wessex felt that all of England was for the Saxons and it should be a United Kingdom or a United yeah, Kingdom <laughs> just of England at that stage. Um, that's how the EU seems to be working at the moment. Uh, we voted to leave. And they go, well, it doesn't work like that. You're, you're part of our sphere of influence. You'll do as you're told. Um, it just They are just creating such a clear message of why we were right to get the heck away from them as fast as possible. There can be no negotiation with someone that doesn't respect you and treat you as an equal. Um, and I, I can't see the negotiation going very much further unless unless someone actually removes the EU and does it as a, a uh, council of ministers from the different countries and negotiates with us. That's possibly the only only way forward with it. Um, you've got to admire uh, the Ramonas in Parliament. There's a bunch of people here who will not forgive the British people for voting for Brexit. They will not forgive us that we want our own democracy and our own rules. Um, and anything, any opportunity uh, they can find to try and poor scorn on it their take and um yeah good to see they kept up their 100 percent record of failure indeed they are at least consistent it, just on on the talking of people who could keep up a record of failure this week um the lib dems have posted out uh put out their uh, uh uh report on why they lost the last election um i haven't bothered reading it i don't think there's really any need to read it from our perspective if if you come to an election that says vote for us because we don't take your vote seriously you kind of get what you deserve indeed and they certainly did and uh, no one deserved it more than uh, than joe swinton absolutely well i'm delighted to to welcome now to the podcast councillor jeep baines the conservative councillor for addiscombe east ward here in croydon uh, jeep welcome to the podcast and uh, thanks for uh, agreeing to speak to us well, thanks, Dan, for having me on. It's it's a real pleasure to be able to speak to you. Uh, so first things first, before we get into any any politics at all, uh, how are you coping with the lockdown? Um, all good so far. Thank you for asking. Um, I'm keeping myself and my family safe at home. And um, so, yeah, touch wood, we're all good. I have elderly parents who are also in Croydon, um, so they're, they're good as well. You know, you, you know how it is. You have to check that your family's OK 
but it's all good. How how is it with you and yours? Uh, well, uh, my my parents were on a cruise when it all kicked off, so um, oh. they had to get flown back from the uh, from the Caribbean and uh, had the had the holiday cut short. Uh, but for myself, um, I've been I've been okay really because uh, I work I, I'm able to work from home for the most part if I, if I need to. So um, so I'm glad to say I've not been furloughed or anything like that. So um, yeah, it's all, all's well with me. Good, glad to hear it. Um, so gee, you you were interviewed by us uh, back in January, and you'd uh, you'd not long been since you were the uh, parliamentary candidate for the Conservatives uh, up in Luton, yeah. and uh, you talked to us a little bit about the uh, the campaign up there in obviously the general election uh, back in December, uh, and, and you said at the time you said that throughout the campaign I felt that the electorate had a clear choice between a Marxist agenda from Labour and an economy boosting agenda from the Conservatives. What do you think the main lessons were for all the parties from the last general election? Yes. So um, what I meant by that comment was in you know in previous elections, I remember people used to complain that all the parties are the same, and people even used to say that David Cameron looked like a copy of Blair and Clegg looked like Cameron, and they all looked the same even. And I don't I don't know if you remember, people always used to talk about winning the centre ground because that's where you could mop up votes and I felt last year's election in particular was not that so Jeremy Corbyn for example he in no way represented a thing called the centre ground and Boris Johnson was clear for example on Brexit and just his force of personality meant he was a completely distinct figure from Blair or Cameron um, so that's what I meant that the, the, the choice this time round was really clear there was um, you know, it, it was not the case that it was two candidates sort of saying the same thing. This time, you know, on the one hand, you had uh, an avowedly hard left Labour candidate who was quite open about nationalising great swathes of the British economy. Um, we had a Chancellor, if you remember, in the Houses of Parliament, in the House of Commons. He, in his early days, he threw Mao's little red book across to George Osborne and said, kind of, you know, have that. That's what I'm all about. So you had people like that on one side and a party who was, in my view, you know, they reeked of anti-Semitism. You had that party on one side and on the other party, on the other side, the choice was, um, well, you know, Boris. <laughs> so it was, it was completely, it was a very stark choice, unlike before. And that's what I kind of meant by that there was a clear choice. So I think for me, the lessons were, um, I would say, number one, the leader matters. You know, it, the, the leader always matters, but it really showed this time the leader matters. Corbyn was just an immensely flawed character who was found wanting on so many levels. Um, I think also uh, another lesson would be I found that there are just certain things that the British people will not countenance. So, for example, Marxism, however you dress it up, Nobody in Britain is re interested in Marxism. We found that out this time around, if we needed to. Um, prejudice, you know, the British people won't put up with prejudice. I had a feeling that Labour, perhaps they calculated that anti-Semitism wasn't a vote loser and maybe they could indulge some of their extreme elements without damaging them electorally. Maybe that was their calculation, I don't know. But if it was, you know, they were wrong. I, I think quietly privately the british people will not put up with that kind of prejudice i think another lesson was um particularly for labor you can't have an awful front bench i mean i think i just thought their front bench was shocking um, let's just leave that there i won't go into the names um a couple of other ones i think in terms of lessons um from the lib dems you know you need a it, it was it was clear you need a credible leader but also somebody who's um, believable. So, for example, Jo Swinson, who kept on calling herself the next prime minister, it just wasn't credible. It kind of went beyond laughable. And I think she dropped it a bit too late in the day. And, you know, if you look at her exit from the political scene, it was a pretty sobering political lesson that everybody was was watching. And I think finally, from my own personal experience, a, a lesson would be, um, local action on the ground, there's no substitute for it. It's still really, really cr uh, crucial in elections. So I was 
selected quite late in the day to stand for Luton North. Um, but I put in a lot of effort locally, lots of different, you know, community uh, organizations, um, hustings, debates, radio interviews and so on. I put in a lot of effort and I was, you know, I was proud that the Labour Labour majority was reduced by more than a third in Luton North. Um, so for me, those were the kind of lessons from, from that election and why I thought, you know, uh, this time around there was a clear choice. Well, yeah, and indeed, obviously, uh, Boris Johnson was uh, successful and the Conservatives were returned with a, uh, a, th- a stonking majority, I yeah, think is the, yeah, the, the term that, that he uh, that he used. Um, well, of course, since then, we have uh, officially left the European Union at the end of uh, January. And uh, we were, I say, looking forward to some um, trade discussions, but uh, and hopefully formally leaving the European Union at the end of the year. Uh, but of course, something has now um, has, has turned up. So we're in lockdown at the moment, but uh, obviously that will that will end hopefully uh, sooner rather than later. Um, and we'll need to get the economy up and running again. What would you like to see the government do to uh, to get things moving? Yes, uh, you're absolutely right. We were all looking forward to you know um, getting the EU situation concluded, and you know, this is a worldwide pandemic. It's uh, in some cases, um, in some senses, unprecedented, at least for a very long time. I mean, some of the things in my view, um, for the immediate situation, um, I'm thinking about the testing. I do think the testing needs to keep on improving. You know, I think a lot has already happened, but I think it needs to pick up pace. Um, I'm also picking up, for example, that there might be differences in the way some of the tests are done. Um, I'm not 100% clear on this, but I'm I'm hearing things like the home kit that's received for testing involves inserting a long swab into your nose and then pushing it through there to the back of your throat. You know, that doesn't sound very <laughs> pleasant, but um, my understanding is that's what the home kit does. Whereas if you go to the um like the so-called drive-in center centers where the army does it, it's just a swab at the back of your throat through your mouth. So I'm not you know, certain on this, and you sort of wonder why there's a difference. But that whole testing, I think, needs to be really ramped up. Also, I think the talk of um, uh, 10 days before you get your result coming through, I think that needs to be improved. I know the government's doing a lot. They're pulling out all the stops on all of this. And we've got to remember this is um, you know, an unprecedented national effort, um, but we can always improve. Um I also think, actually, on the question of personal protective equipment, uh, PPE, there have been rumblings about um, not using the private sector enough. Um, Now, obviously, the government has said, I I recall, for example, Matt Hancock saying they've had some uh, companies that were formed in the last week now applying for government contracts. So you can't have that. We've got to check things properly. We've got to verify the bona fides of potential suppliers. But one would think that established firms could have a much more expedited way of dealing with government procurement. And I think that kind of thing can be improved because wherever we can get PPE of the right quality, we should be looking at ways to speed that up. Um, And I think another thing to get things going, at some point at least, I think we've got to look at the culture of the public sector. You know, it's, it's kind of long, ponderous committees, slow decision-making processes. And I've done some work you know, in my own, um, my own work life, a fair amount consulting to the public sector. There's a sort of bias towards caution and inaction. That, you know, I think that kind of thing at the best of times is not the best way to do things. But in the situation we have today, it could potentially be lethal. So I think you know, these are the sorts of areas we've got to look at to get things moving. So once we've uh, moved out of this of this stage, either gradually or you know eventually, um, is there anything you'd like to see the government do to get the the economy up and running so we can get somewhere somewhere near back to where we were and and moving forward from that point? Well, I think you know the support that's been provided for you know for example people being able to go on the furlough scheme. Um, there's been more help for self-employed people. Perhaps some of that could stay in place longer um, while while companies get back on their feet. I think the 
provision of loans and grants, particularly to smaller businesses, if it could be simplified and speeded up. I'm, I'm hearing better news on that recently. When it first started, a lot of particularly small businesses were saying they're having to fill in the same old forms and go through the same procedure with the banks. And it takes a very long time. But their problem is um, is cash flow. You know, it's the old, um, what's the saying? Revenue is revenue is vanity, profit is sanity, cash is king. You know, and if you haven't got the cash, you need it now. So I think those kind of areas, particularly for small businesses, if things can be speeded up to get cash to people who need it quickly, that's the area I think we need to look at, keep on going on. Is that the right English? Keeping on going on, on those fronts. Well, uh, back to the, the the political day job, as it were. Yeah. Uh, when you've when you've finished running the uh, running the country, as it were, um, <laughs> you, you've now represented uh, two different areas in Croydon as a councillor. Uh, what are the uh, main issues that you've seen come up, and uh, what do you see impacting Croydon that may be different from other areas? Yes, so I stood for, I represented Coolsdon West for two terms and now I'm rep- representing Addiscombe East. So um, they are different in some ways. Coolsdon, um, Coolsdon actually has still has vestiges of resentment that they are even a part of Croydon. They don't like being a part of Croydon. So there are some people who still have that problem, even though I think the decision goes back to the 60s. I, I um, can account to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you know, so the issues that I dealt with over there, they were mainly around um, inappropriate planning applications. I remember there were traffic issues near the lo- one of the new local supermarkets, um, but also around how the Labour Council... We're going to, you know, as usual, ignore local people in their plans for the local community centre. So those are sorts of issues. But in my first term in Coulston West, I was also heavily involved um, in seeing the new Cane Hill development come into fruition. So at that time, uh, the Conservatives ran the council and and it was a very complete contrast to the way we see things being done under the present Labour administration. So, for example, Cane Hill. I, you know, it's it's a beautiful example of homes and flats built on previously unused land, which provides accommodation to people who need it. Um, and we were very careful when we put Cane Hill in place that um, that it was connected to the existing Coulston town. And I don't know if you know, there's a place called Nevin on the Hill, just as you go towards the M25. Um, we didn't want it to be another nether on the hill, which is quite isolated and not connected to anywhere else. So it's an example of doing things, in my view, in the right way. But if you contrast that with Labour, you know, we've got, they are allowing residential homes to be converted into flats anywhere and everywhere, and not just allowing it, they're positively encouraging it. So we know developers, developers know that Croydon is the place to come if you want your planning applications approved. Everybody knows that. But for people who live here, it's becoming a blight on residential uh, streets. Um, you know, if you compare it with other areas, for example, um, neighbouring Sutton and Bromley, they have not signed up to these really quite onerous housing targets that Labour's council in Croydon have um, signed up to. Um, I mean, my understanding is that the Mayor of London has questioned why Croydon's housing target is so high. Um, so for, for me, you know, the, the key word here is inappropriate. I mean, everybody understands we need more housing and we need housing of different types. So it can't all be flats. You know, we can't just have houses being converted into flats and nothing else. We need small, medium, large family homes as well. Um, and these need to be done in a manner that is sensitive to the existing area. But my fear is, you know, as long as Labour keep running Croydon, the current pretty awful situation is going to continue. So for me, those are the issues that, that we have to deal with in Croydon. Well, thanks, G. And it's Mike here. Um, Hi, Mike. You've mentioned uh, the Labour Council now, and they've, they've now won the last two council elections in Croydon. What do yep. you think are going to be the key issues and ways the Conservatives can make a comeback in our town? Well, one one is really clear messaging. So I'll give you an example on this. We still find, I mean, I found it surprising when I first started and I still find it. When we knock on doors, a lot of people do not know 
that it's Labour who control the council. A lot of people just don't know about the difference between, you know, people are getting on with their lives. They don't, they don't think about the council and the national government and things like that. So those of us who are involved in politics, I think we sometimes lose sight of it. A lot of people, they think the Conservatives run the council because, you know, Boris is in number 10. So we've got to be really, really clear. Labour are the ones running the council. Yeah, clear communication is going to be uh, key in this. I also think a lot of people still have a bit of an old fashioned view about the Conservative Party, you know, that perhaps they're, um, you know, they're all white people and they're all sort of older people and stuff like that. So we need to be much more inclusive on that. I think we've done a lot on that, particularly in the local um, uh, Croydon Conservatives. We've done a lot on that. So, you know, we've made huge strides on getting a wide range of people now becoming members of the party. We've had uh, people from all parts of the community standing as candidates. So we need to carry on and keep on that and make sure that's visible to people. But also in terms of the issues, planning and development, as I've spoken about, we need to get people to realise it's happening. We need to personalise it. It's going to happen to you. You need. We need, we need to get people to realise if you live on a road, there is every chance the house next door to you is going to be converted into a block of flats. We've got to get that message across. You know, if Labour stay in power, that's very, very possible. And there's also issues around things like traffic. I mean, I don't know if you, it might, I don't know if you know, but in Addis Kami East, I've been dealing a lot with a, a completely nightmare situation around um, what's happening on, for example, Elgin Road and surrounding roads. The way previous Labour councils have allowed a one-way system which starts from East Croydon and goes up towards Shirley, all that traffic problem is going to be a, a massive issue for us to deal with uh, because of this traffic issues elsewhere as well. And also on things like, you know, how the council is run, the way, for example, children's services, you know, we had a, um, a very, very poor rating from the inspector. We had to have external people stepping in. These are These are examples of how it's very poor at the moment and how we as a conservative administration can just run things a lot better. So those are the sorts of issues in my mind. Can I just sort of step in there for me? You mentioned obviously um, issues around housing and and uh, and developments and turning cows into flats and and building new flats. Um, I think you've got a lot of people moving into Croydon, moving perhaps down from down from more central locations in London because it's cheaper, um, yes. and they they obviously want somewhere to live. Uh, but you've also got a lot of young people who may be from the, the Croydon area who are looking to get on the housing ladder. Um, and I think some of those people, perhaps, you know, they may be into the, the late 20s now, even into their 30s. And they're, should we say, because they're not getting onto the housing ladder at the moment, um, they're looking, they're, they're, they're perhaps not becoming conservatives, shall we say, because that they still you know if if you don't own your own property you're perhaps less likely to be a conservative than 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 if you do um so how do you think those sort of demographic changes of of youngsters and perhaps less less than youngsters not being able to get on the housing ladder uh, is going to affect the conservative party in places like Croydon when on on the, the one hand yes you you've you know the conservatives certainly reached out to communities that you that you've mentioned that perhaps uh, have had a a bad view of the conservatives in the past but when people want properties, they want somewhere to live. They want they want to live in Croydon, and they want to perhaps you know okay a flat or what have you. But then on the other hand, you're saying well you know we, we need to be uh, far more careful about the, the properties that we're building. Uh, how do you think you can you can speak to those people and uh, persuade them to vote vote Conservative rather than Labour? Well, yeah, I think you're absolutely right. There there is um, uh, certainly a demographic change. Uh, that's hap has been happening and continues to happen in Croydon. There are more people coming into Croydon, and it's great that people want to live in Croydon. For me, it's about we have to provide the right kind of accommodation and a variety of types of accommodation be made available to those who want to come here. But at the same time, those who already live in flats or homes in Croydon, their wishes and desires and rights also need to be protected. And for me, this is not an insoluble problem. I mean, I gave the example of Cane Hill in Coulsdon West. There are alternatives to, in my view, 
I would call it blighting res existing resident residential streets by converting houses into flats. I'll give you a couple of examples. Um, one of the roads in my um, in my ward, um, it was a house. A developer applied to convert the house into nine flats. Um, now, and I think it was a three bedroom house. Neighbors either side, they said to me, I get it. You know, young people need accommodation. I was young once. I get it that they need accommodation. But why nine flats? Why can't it be five? That's that's a pretty small house. Why is why why is that allowed to be nine flats? And where's the where are the cars gonna park? How's the infrastructure been factored into coping with that? And those kind of things. And that's that's the balance I'm I'm talking about. I think even people who may be young and are looking for their first flat, they don't want a poor quality one and they want to live in a nice place and they want to make sure that the infrastructure can cope. So for me, it's about getting the balance right. And the way you get the balance right is by being clear that the existing folk are not monsters. They are very understanding folk who want to accommodate more housing provision but we can do it in, in the right way and in a sensitive way and the right numbers of them. So in talking about numbers, I mentioned earlier, why has Croydon signed up pretty much unilaterally to a far higher housing target than Bromley and Sutton? There is no need for that. You know, this, this, we, we've got to look at the way this is being done in a far more sensible way. That, that's my point. Nice, and thank you. Thanks for that, G. Um, so uh, you were uh, kindly going to come to speak to one of our events on the future of the BBC, which uh, yep. we had to postpone and and we will rearrange. Um, obviously, there's a lot of talk about the BBC at the moment. How do you feel they've performed during the pandemic? Well, I mean, you know, overall, I'm a fan of the BBC. And I, you know, the way I think about this is um, if you look at the original uh, John Reith, the Reithian principles of the BBC, which were to inform, educate, and entertain. So if you sort of look at it under those three headings, in, during the pandemic, I would say, in terms of inform, um, you know, the, the, the BBC's got quite amazing resources when you when you go on to their, um, you know, the BBC Sounds app, for example. Um, I, I quite like documentaries personally. So during the pandemic, I've listened to there was a there was a mid '90s radio series of about 15 or 16 episodes about called Civilization, and it started from you know Mesopotamia, e Egypt, India, China, right up to modern times. You know, I listened to that. I listened to another one on the history of work. Um, and by the way, when you listen to that, apparently the problem all started from when we stopped being hunter gatherers and became farmers. That's apparently where all the all the misery started. Um, I. Um, I also like, you know, Melvin Bragg's in our time. So all that kind of stuff. I think that's been really good during the, the pandemic, being able to tap into those resources. Um, educate. I think from what I've seen, really good resources for kids. You know, people, can, they can access online learning. Um, entertain. Not much comment. You know, it is what it is, depending on your tastes. Um, but on the inform, going back to the inform, so in, in terms of, you know, accessing documentaries and resources, great. But news probably comes under inform. I think there's, a, there's something to be said about the way news is happening from the BBC. Um, I mean, I would say there's less rigor in how they are coming across as being impartial. So, I mean, an example would be, I think it was just maybe yesterday. There's an article by Laura Koonsberg. Who, who, whom I otherwise like, and I think she's really good. But her article, uh, the title of it was, um, and it was in reference to uh, the first time uh, Boris and Keir Starmer have faced each other in the Commons. And the title of it was, The Lawyer Versus the Showman. And I sort of scratched my head and I thought to myself, well, you know, it's a minor point, but you sort of think, how, did the, how, how does that get allowed? You know, why isn't there someone somewhere, someone somewhere saying, you know, hang on a minute that that's pretty that sounds pretty biased you know you're obviously trying to put boris down by calling him the showman and up 
Starmer a little bit by calling him the lawyer. So that kind of thing is an example of it's not it's not the end of the world. I don't think it makes the BBC evil or anything, but it does indicate that perhaps there's less rigor around how they come across as being impartial. That would be my view about how the BBC has been during the pandemic. No, and there's, there's an interesting thing though with Boris. There's 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 a an attempt there to not suggest that he's perhaps up to it or bright enough. And yes. it's probably not many people who read classics at uh, Oxford who aren't that bright. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know, it, it's it's uh yes, it doesn't doesn't fit with reality. Um, okay, uh, well thanks for that. And that, so. So we'll get that rearranged and uh, hopefully uh, listeners will come along and, and hear more from you on that, that subject at the time. Yeah, that'd be um, great. Moving on to perhaps our favourite subject, uh, or, or the thing <laughs> we started out life as. Yeah, uh, yeah. Saw a tweet from you a little while back complaining about the council not looking at the opportunities from Brexit. What do you think the opportunities specifically for are for Croydon when we're finally fully out of the EU and out of the transition period? Yeah, so I, I remember that and I tweeted about it. And that was a scrutiny and overview committee uh, meeting in the in the council. Now, just so you understand, the, the scrutiny and overview committee is supposed to be apolitical. I mean, there's always politics and everything, but that that particular committee you know, comprises Labour and con uh, Conservative councillors, and we're not supposed to be political. Uh, so... What they do in that in that committee, you have various um, um, cabinet members and officers of, officers of the council coming in and presenting things like the future strategy or the plans and so on. And in one of those, they had a, some slides on, you know, Brexit, and they kept on saying there is a threat because of Brexit. And that was where I, I, I sort of said to them, um, and you may have seen it in the clip. I said, well, why why, why have you called that a threat and not an opportunity? So, you know, you know, I'm sure you've done these. Anyone who's done these um, strengths, weaknesses, opportunity, threat kind of yeah. exercises, right? SWOT. And always when you do those kind of things, when you write down a threat, you can also see it as an opportunity because if you Absolutely. do the opposite, can't you, right? So, so, for example, Brexit, they put Brexit is a threat because we may lose trade. But you could say, well, Brexit is an opportunity because we can make new trade deals and there's more freedom and there's a different way of doing things. So for me, it was about the mindset. Again, I referred to this earlier, the mindset of the public sector. It's it's cautious. It's unimaginative, bland, box ticking. It's not thinking in a different way. And for me, that's what that was about. So, you know, I think, you know, Croydon, um, we should be we should be making connections with the relevant government departments that are right now busy trying to do deals with you know other countries and make new trade deals. We need to go and find out who are the key figures in those government departments, what deals are starting to be made, even if they're not there yet. Let's get in on that conversation, get them to know Croydon is a very, very keen partner to benefit from this. Um, we should be thinking about, you know, why can't we go to, for example, to some American firms and say, obviously, there's an emerging deal here. I know it hasn't been signed yet, but something is almost certainly going to happen. You know, why don't we talk to some of these? Why doesn't Croydon talk to some of these Amer American firms and say, you know, we'd love you to come and locate into Croydon when this deal is done? Or, you know, associated services, accounting, legal, banking. Could you have a branch in Croydon? You know, let's do things. New businesses locating in Croydon. It requires imagination. And that, that was my point there. To simply keep on saying Brexit equals threat. Oh, my God, it's so awful. We've got to stop that. We've got to have it's an opportunity. The people have voted for it. It's happening. Stop it with the misery. Now let's see how we're going to really get good benefits from it, particularly for, for Croydon. No, it's, it's a really key point. It, it always struck me. I remember us. Uh, as a campaign talking about it at the time that the very multicultural nature of Croydon is a is a huge opportunity here where we might do less trade with Europe we will do more trade with the world um, mm. and and you pick a country there's a community group for it in Croydon um, that's that's got to be a strength that's got to be a, something you can in in the best possible way exploit as an Absolutely. opportunity um, 
Yes. Yeah, no, it's uh, very, very well put there. Well, um, thanks for your time again, uh, there, G, and um, all the best for the future and, and uh, in, in Addiscombe and uh, representing the people there. Uh, just wonder if there's anything else you want to sort of say before you go and... Uh, uh, no, no th thank, thank you, Mike and Dan. Um, just to say, the first time I've done one of these and I really, really enjoyed it. So thanks for giving me the opportunity. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. So, Mike, good to uh, good to speak with Jeet there. Um, what were your uh, highlights for you? Um, yeah, good good to speak, Jeet. Uh, he, he fought in a tough campaign um, in Luton in the general election. Um, you know, it's really hard to put yourself forward in that kind of position, and uh, he did. And it's interesting to hear about that and his thoughts on the campaign generally. Um, also, liked hearing about uh, what what's going on in Croydon. Uh, obviously, his council that's represented a couple of wards. He's very close to the issues in Croydon, um, and he, he put some interesting thoughts up there around. Um, Big tension in Croydon, as I think in a lot of places around the country, is around development and new building and, 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 and uh, inappropriate planning permissions. And some of what he put forward as appropriate planning permissions. Now, I live next to Cane Hill. Um, I know there is some opposition locally. Uh, it is a very nice estate. It's a very pleasant place to go up to uh, when you're allowed out uh, of the house for an hour a day. You know, it's a very pleasant place to wander around. Um, it, it is in keeping with the area. It does have links locally uh, to local shops and what have you, unlike the kind of developments that are being approved around here at the moment, which are great big dirty tower blocks in the middle of small residential streets. Um, uh, so, yeah, good. Uh, it, it, interesting stuff and and talking about what's possible rather than what's just not possible and you don't like. No, definitely, definitely good to hear from uh, from one of our councillors here in Croydon. Well, Mike, we've got a uh, interesting article and a, uh, a good interview on our website. Why don't you uh, tell the listeners about those? Yes, so Josh Ascoff uh, wrote to, wrote for us again. This time, looking at some of the um, free market uh, liberal options for running a school system, um, and particularly how you could free up that market. So, schooling with a libertarian perspective, you might call it. Um, points out a few things really that a parent knows how to talk to their child in order for them to understand whether the subject be simple or complex in a manner their child can grasp. Parents should be at the start, at the front of what a school system is. Um, it is after, they are after all their children and uh, there are some rumours that the reason some of the teaching unions don't want to go back right now is, or maybe should want to go back is because a lot of parents have realised that what they get delivered at school is not not quite as much as they'd hoped for. But he goes on to say a private market education would allow education providers to supply schools, uh, models, methods and qualifications which parents actually value in a market. We all vote through a price mechanism. So he's talking about school vouchers here. Massive issue in the States, not so much of an issue here. But frankly, and this sort of slightly happens today, but not fully. Why shouldn't parents be able to vote with their feet? If a school does well, why shouldn't it get more money and have the chance to expand? And if a school does badly and parents don't want to go there, why should we pay for it? Well worth a read, give you some new ideas, something different on the way education can work. Uh, we've got a second article here, an interview with Duncan Forsyth. The, he was the Croydon North lead in the EU referendum uh, vote. So uh, when we were in that, that campaign, uh, Dan and I, and Duncan was there in, in Croydon North. Um, Duncan, uh, first time he'd been involved in political campaigning, really interesting, describes himself as a Marxist libertarian. And it's well worth uh, going to read there what that is and why he describes himself in that way. Um, done a lot of work in the north, but also he was very much behind our canvassing of New Addington, which had a huge turnout, uh, something even remarked upon by the BBC uh, news website, where there was a really big difference made up there. Makes a few interesting points about the modern left. Um, it gave up on saying it gave up on freedom when it embraced state and corporate censorship of speech. And it gave up on democracy when it embraced rule by remote, unaccountable organisations such as the EU. Uh, unfortunately, many still feel that way on the left. Um, just talking about the campaign mentions here in the closing weeks of the campaign, when the attitude of militant Ramona's morphed from complacency to blind panics as the polls moved in our favour. And I think uh, he was saying how happy he was at that. Again, well worth a read. 
harks back to some of the campaign locally. Um, even if you're not from the area, it's worth understanding kind of some of how that went on. And really interesting to hear about a left wing libertarian perspective that he's put forward there. Um, yeah, good, good, uh, good interest and, and something to uh, keep you busy. No, excellent. Really, uh, really enjoyed both both pieces. Good to hear some uh, options for education, and uh, and great to hear from uh, Duncan again and uh, his reflections on the uh, on Croydon North uh, on the Croydon North referendum campaign, and of course the the campaign across uh, across Croydon. No, it was uh, no, very good stuff. Uh, well, if you'd like to write for our website or have any stories which you would like us to cover, please do contact us. Uh, you can do so via Twitter at Croydon Const, via our Facebook page via our website, which is croydonconstitutionalist.uk, or via email, croydonconstitutionalist at gmail.com. Uh, until the next time, please do subscribe to the podcast and the, the uh, podcast and our YouTube channel. Please do like, share, and uh, if you want to, please do leave a review. And if you'd uh, like to get in contact, uh, please do by any of the uh, aforementioned uh, methods. Uh, thank you once again for listening. And until next time, it's goodbye from me. And it's goodbye from me. Stay safe, everybody.